We have time for some questions, don't worry, but it's, it is kind of wrapping up time also, and it's very appropriate that um, many of the projects that were mentioned involved a whole swab of the artists who were involved in this Bargil exhibition, but also its discursive program. So, for example, um, uh, Kaylin mentioned Jemana Manaz, a magical substance close into me, which we showed a segment of here when we put a transgenerational conversation, staged one, between Kamal Bolata and Jemana Manna. And I was very happy that later on, when I moved to Chicago, it was one of the first acquisitions that I made actually for the MCA was that specific film because I thought it was a really rethinking of how archival practice could be animated. Um, but also Emily Jester's work was also on view here in her retrospective, the material for film, for film. And many of the artists that you discussed in both of your presentations have featured not only in the Bargeel displays, but also throughout the White Chapel in different kinds of ways. So it feels like this panel really is a kind of pulling together of different threads. I have two questions to ask you and then we'll open up to the public. Um, what I, the first thing is, you, which is that all of you discuss the idea of publics in different ways. So you discuss this idea of the public being able to materially engage with objects, to touch objects, to physically think about the object as a thing. And you talked about this idea that the public was somehow... Um, having to redeal or re deal with this idea of restitution or reconstitution through these very specific archives. Uh, and Iftikhar, you talked about this idea of publics in a kind of almost um, transnational way in terms of asking us to reimagine who are these publics because they move across a huge geographic swath that we maybe don't necessarily assume to be the publics of those specific places. So on that note, I want to ask you how important or how, looking back at your presentations now, the role of publics in animating and activating the work that you do and that you'll continue to do with your research? You start. You start. Public. <laughs> Anything to do with public. Okay. So, so why is everyone just, looking? Just say okay. public. Uh, no, okay, so let me just say that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Omar, for the question. Let me just say, you know, just to frame the question would be to say that for me, I think of not public but publics, okay? Yeah. So then immediately you get out the problem of, uh, you know, whether there is, what kind, what, what is the nature of the public? Because the public, publics are also differentiated by, you know, by various ways, right? By various markers. And the other thing to state is that the public, that publics are not passive, but they are in a constitutive relationship with, with an exhibition or with the art object. And a good exhibition or a good curatorial strategy would be to think actively about how or a museological strategy, or the strategy of a collection, would be to really think actively about how one can activate, you know, uh, diverse publics. Okay, so um, and that's and that's a, that's a kind of a, that's a fascinating, open-ended, uh, and continuous process of engagement. Okay. Tell me again the question. Well, maybe publics. it's just about how you see publics engaging with your work. And maybe one way into it also is thinking about the fact that you're writing for also a, a more populist audience through the, 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 the populist, I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> okay. Popular. Um, uh, but and you also invoked Edward Said, who is the most popular thinker. I mean, his books are published by major publishers, probably the, one of the few academics who may or may not have had a literary agent, or at least would demand one now, you know. I mean, yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm writing for a broader audience, right? That's what so I mean. maybe not populist, <laughs> yeah. but but I'm trying to reach, uh, you know, uh, maybe even a general audience, which is um, I think really important. And I mean, this is why I uh, hooked on to these texts by Said that were in the London Review of Books, because it's beyond academia and it's beyond um, the literary world or the art world or these tiny segmented things. But um, but I think, I mean, on, I think even though he is extremely popular, it's important to keep the, his ideas at okay. play yeah. in, in public discussions like this. And him and Abdel Fattah Kadito and certain, um, and Angela Tufik, like I think it's important to keep, to not let these ideas be kind of forgotten or rarefied. So it's not just, I mean, the thing is, it's not just Edward Said, the guy who threw the rock. Right? I mean, it has to be, and like not only the guy who wrote Orientalism, but what specifically is the argument of Orientalism? Because it, it, people's interpretations of it change, and its role changes. But I think um, 
something interesting about the way artists are working with publics is that, I mean, a lot of the practices, at least, that I talked about are, are coming out of situations where political participation is unsatisfying. Yeah. And the notion of citizenship, I really hope that's not my phone. No, it's not. Um, where where um, the notions of citizenship are problematic, and I think um, one of the reasons why um, installations that, that, that involve this interaction is because it's not that it stands in for political participation, but it offers another way to do something similar. And I think that's important. And it's not necessarily geographically specific, but it's, it's sort of a condition. Um, yeah, I mean, it was fascinating to be, when I, when, I mean, with the putting up the show in Marrakesh, in these very, very, very public places where it was like tourists in the hundreds, probably thousands every day that passed through and our relationship to them and how was it, like it was very important for us to really disseminate the information. I was very reticent of like thinking, you know, responsibly that I want people, if they wanted the information, they can get it. Mm -hmm. They can get it in a prolonged way they can get it in an abridged way. It was possible on multiple levels. I, for one, was like a little soldier doing tours every day for six weeks of the biennial, sometimes twice a day. So this was something I was doing. I trained a group of young uh, educators in Marrakesh, in, and, and they were trained in multiple languages. So it was like a training of trainers, and they did tours for all the schools. We reached 5,000 young school children. I think the count is a little bit over 5,000. I would see them like parade every single day. It was very important to bring out the ideas. The publication, for example, was something that I also thought provocatively ab about because we have a lot of publications that end up in bookstores and you know, are not accessible for people to get and they cost a lot of money to print. So I thought, what if I was gonna, and I didn't have the time to make a publication. Mm -hmm. So I asked the artists to contribute and they create their mini booklets mm -hmm. in a very simple format of like an A5, so anyone can print it. It's all available on the website. And then we were able to print these booklets in 10,000 pieces for each artist, mm -hmm. because it's just paper. It's no binding, there's no, you know, it's just stapling. And we put these booklets every day, we stacked them for the people in the biennial. And people could collect whatever they saw, and that beca became a reference further for them. And I asked the artist, very simply, to also try to do it visually. So if people didn't know the references, the, the excerpt of the pieces were written in English, Arabic, and French mm -hmm. for all audiences, but maybe people didn't understand that kind of convoluted art speak, right? Of, which we all fall into. They had a semantic of research from the artist in visual language provided in these small booklets. So that's, I mean, I think in short, I agree with Iftikhar, it's publics, but we also have a responsibility mm -hmm. as curators, as educators, as intellectuals to reach out and try to break down this kind of information. Mm -hmm. So my second and last question is really about the idea of institutions, which you all touched upon. And for me, I guess it's a difficult question to phrase because I'm wondering if the lack of institutions uh, seem to be a provocation in yours, Kaylin. Is it somehow the lack of institutions has enabled a kind of imagination? And I feel like also that in yours, that the lack of traditional museum white walls created a richness and a context to truly create a panorama of of exhibitions, really, that were independent. And then with you, Iftikhar, you were also talking about, and kind of contra that, the, the birth of new organizations, but also discussing practices that were very much outside of the wall, such as Imran Qureshi. So I'm wondering if the lack of an institutional infrastructure at times has created the context for these artists to work, and how might the building of institutions then shift that work, or is it a concern of yours, perhaps? 
I think it's not a lack. Okay. It's just yeah. maybe, I mean, because there are, you know, there are museums. Mm. And there are, but, but and, and those museums have interesting histories. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, you know, there are archives and there are mm. national libraries and stuff, but it's maybe that, that, that uh, maybe it's the, the gap in discourse between those institutions and the way artists are working, or, mm. I mean, I think it's, it's something like that, but I don't think lack is the word that I would yeah. use. Okay. Dean? Um. <laughs> I just got me a off guard. I thought you were going first. <laughs> um, um, I think, well, it's interesting because I've always been involved in institutional building. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm, it's my life's mission to build something because we don't have a state, so maybe that's, like I'm always seeking to build something. And, uh, and maybe in the building process, that's also interesting because I learned something. Because it, maybe that opens a, a, a schism to search for ideas of things that are in process that want to happen and are about the creative act and the possibilities. If they do, you know, great. If they don't, you know, at least you're, built, you're part of the narrative that is about creative thinking and knowledge building. Mm -hmm. um, to answer you, I think also, for example, I'm just anecdotally, I'm going to reference the Palestinian Museum now, which has recently been built. It's a fascinating edifice, beautiful, all to the green measures of like the 21st century, building in the middle of Birzeit nearby Ramallah city. And they're still, I mean, they have the vision, they know what they want to do, but it's, it's still a question, it's a polemic about are they a national museum in a place that is not a nation, but they're not a national museum because it's not government owned. Mm. And then there, there, there is like a site of possibilities that is almost, and the antithesis of the institution, mm. right? Like what we think about as the traditional institution. And I think there is room there for thinking about, I think it's always important to ask yourself in, within the institution, on the outskirts of the institution, away from it, where are its limitations? How can you break it? How can it reframe itself and think beyond the box, but also not be essentialist? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, institutions are, you know, there are various kinds, right? So there are public institutions, there are private institutions, there are institutions that have infrastructure, there are institutions that lack or work with, you know, I mean, even some of these artists, they built the Arab Image Foundation, which is, I guess, a kind of an institution yeah. while doing their work, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and but, uh, but generally speaking, of course, in this region, there is a lack of institutions, of course, you know, and of course, there is a need for much more in that, you know, you, you, need, you need educational institutions, you need museums, you need public institutions, you need private institutions, you need collections, you need curatorial programs, you need, you need all of that and you need much more of that. You need, you know, artistic uh, residencies and exchanges, you need, uh, you, know, uh, you know, grants and commissioning, you know, agencies. So, you know, the, the, the scope is endless. But, but I think yeah. also, but it's important to say one thing, Iftikhar, and then within this context is that, um, I mean, there's a level of where a lot of institutions are having a problem kind of continuing because we just build the institutions, but, you know, we forget about the legacy of the ones that were built, but don't have any means to sustain themselves. And this so is, you know, you mean, third world. Do you mean public institutions? Public institutions, yeah. nonprofit institutions, and yeah. many of them, you know, we're just accumulating institutions. And I, I, I all, I'm also wary of that, that is ha happening as a trend in the Middle East. Oh, okay, but, but I, I would make a distinction between a public institution yeah. and a not for profit, right? Uh, in the sense that a public institution could be state owned or owned by the government or a city or something or a municipality, whereas a not for profit might be a private. Um, institution. institution, right? And I think that is in the sense that if, if public institutions are more moribund or not, not functioning well, there's also room to, I mean, Growth that is, you know, private. they also belong to us, you know, basically yes. that we should make a claim for public institutions as belonging to us and make a claim for their, you know, towards their improvement and their, re, uh, you know, renewal, right? Um, so I don't see it as an either or. Okay. okay. I definitely so, think that yeah. there are numerous institutions that have closed and opened, whether you're talking about Beirut and Cairo or many of the institutions in Egypt that because of legislation have dis 
chosen to disappear, or others in other contexts which were ephemeral institutions that were, that, whose existence was always intended to be limited. But I do think that maybe the question was meant to also be about trying to think about how a polyphony of different kinds of institution needs to exist in this very con difficult as, you know, in, 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 a, in a region that has very different contours than some of the Western contexts, perhaps. So uh, we open up to you for any questions that you might have. There's a roving mic, please, um, over here. Um, thank you uh, to, to all uh, the panel for a very rich uh, discussion. Uh, I wanted to actually make a connection between Kalin's and Iftikhar's presentation and then ask a question for the panel at, at large. Uh, and the connection, uh, which I think was this East, uh, sorry, South and West Asia one, um, and given by your choice of Edward Said. Now, Edward Said, we all know Orientalism, but this other book was um, Culture and Imperialism, which he dedicated to Iqbal Ahmed. So Iqbal Ahmed, for those of you who don't know, was born in India, died in Pakistan, uh, you know, cut his uh, cloth, if you like, in, in Algeria, in the Algerian uh, civil wars. But they both ended up teaching in you know the north uh, the northwest or the northeast of the, of the U.S. and the question that goes back to is we've talked about decolonization a lot yeah but all of you uh, for most of your lives and and sort of given the fact that we're having this uh, uh, event in London um, are actually based not in the the regions that we're discussing so there is a mirror side to decolonization uh, which the Taiwanese uh, uh, culture theorist talk, uh, Chen Quan Sing talks about as de-imperialization. Yeah? Uh, and, and so one of the things is that even the book that accompanied this uh, exhibition is actually w being circulated by a, a Euro-American uh, publisher and distributor. So the fact that you know, decolonization is all well and good, but if you don't actually also de-imperialize at the same time, it was published in Arabic and also distributed by an Arabic press. Also. Okay, so I stand corrected, so. but there is, uh, you know, but you probably won't be able to get that Arabic one here, or you know, what is the reach of that elsewhere? Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, this idea of de-imperialization yeah. and then how we sort of kind of use the institutional infrastructure here and intervene either in London or New York or uh, with these institutions. Uh, I think is, is something that we also need to address, and which I don't, I don't think we've addressed so far today. Um, I think that's a, a really big statement in common. Um, so I would ask you to keep your responses, if possible, brief, in c because I do think that that is a whole lecture um, there. So just because I know <laughs> there might be a couple more questions that I'd like to enable you. So please, if you could respond briefly and, and emotionally, maybe. Yeah, I don't. I mean. <laughs> The here or there thing is something I think about every single day, and I think pretty much anybody who is based in, in one or two places or who moves back and forth probably thinks about every single day, and it's painful. Um, I mean, and it, it, you know, I have, I have some of the most incredible students at AUB. They're to in terms, like overall, generally, their educational system up until the point when I teach them when they're 19 years old is completely scrambled because they've grown up all over the world. French systems, English systems, Arabic systems, they have no common points of references among them, but they are so sharp and they are so smart. <coughs> and it, they leave, they go to grad school abroad, and it really breaks my heart because, but what am I gonna say? Stay for the rest of your lives? And it's, 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 it's really, I think it's forever an unsettled issue. I think it's, it's constitutive of this, these processes for this to be a painful and unsettled question. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the problem of the brain drain that was actually identified in, you know, by, you know, by decolon the beginning of decolonization, right? This is not, not something new. But I think there is something new now, which is that uh, there's, the, you know, there's more exchange, there's more travel, there's more, uh, you know, uh, people people can teach classes, you know, remotely. Um, for instance, I go and teach seminars in on uh, theory and methods every year in Pakistan. You know, it's not a full course, but I do what I can. For example, so it's um, so at some level, uh, you know, of course, these are uh, uh, problems of kind of patronage infrastructure and so on, and the old problem of the brain drain. And I think we live we it's it's an imperfect world we live in, and. Uh, 
uh, we do what we can uh, okay in this uh, I, I don't have a magic solution to this I'm done with New York. <laughs> I moved. <laughs> if you haven't heard the news, I left. I came back. I'm now based right from. I'm 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 back in the region, and and that is a conscious decision, after a long agonizing journey of eight years, of seeing inequity in the way my culture, my people, our history, everything is referenced, and I've had enough of it, and I can't. I can't be bothered to to work in that kind of um, in that kind of environment. I need to go back and and really work on what I think is a self-assertion of ideas from where I belong. And where I belong is a really big place. And as I said, I'm not being. It's not Palestine. It's now it's Marrakesh. You know, it's Beirut one day. You know, tomorrow it'll be Bombay and Pakistan. Like. It's a big terrain for me, and there's a solidarity in those ideas that I really want to go back and explore, and that's that's the truth for it for myself. Other questions? Is that emotional enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? We have like five minutes, so if you don't want to speak now, we have four minutes. <laughs> um, there's a question. Right? Yeah, there's a question there. You. Um, I want to go back to um, talking, presenting a lot of art, Arab artists in the diaspora, and I want to um, ask if it's almost like a trend to be in the diaspora producing art or to have traveled abroad to study. Um, and I want to ask almost if it's if it's a necessity to leave to study to become an international contemporary artist. Um, because I can see it's in a lot of young Arab artists who are yet to emerge as on the international scene. Shall I take that one? Um, I, I mean, I, I worked in Palestine on the building of an academy in Ramallah in Palestine. We know of, for example, an academy that, uh, and the academy which is home workspace program in Beirut now, that is also, um, fascinating space where it's sort of like a postgraduate level. It, it doesn't give a, um, a accreditation, but it's a place for people to really kind of build their um, portfolio as artists and as practitioners in the arts. There are spaces for artists to really start to think and do things. This is to address what our, uh, Iftikhar was saying, that there's still a need in various places in the Arab world and in, uh, in Africa and South Asia to have more of these institutions. For what it is, the institutions that are there are actually much more fascinating. The smaller ones are much more fascinating in their discourse, in their ability to break the boundaries than what I've seen in parallels in the US or Europe. But they're very, let's say their capacities are very small. And then there's the real kind of problematic, which is, um, it's very difficult to live in certain spaces where, you know, there's wars happening, uh, there's issues of border <laughs> crossings, visas, I mean, accessibility to like just the, the, the reality of living. And sometimes as artists and as people, as human beings, you just don't want to think about that day to day. And I think that's another polemic that we have to address that is a crucial issue. And it's been the legacy since decolonization where people have resorted to living in the West, in Europe, in the US, in order to be able to develop their ideas without having to go back to the very basics. Can, can I, ju I would just like to take, as add to that to say that I think that there once was a time where there it may have been a kind of necessity or seen as a necessity. If you think of whether it was Joad Salim or Shakir Hassan Said studying at the slate, but then going back, mm -hmm. you did have to um, perhaps study abroad at some point in your life. But I think there's something that you're saying that also I feel is that it's become a much more personal choice about whether you want to make that decision to go and study abroad for a couple of years or to live in the diaspora anymore. I think that I think we are much more enabled to empower despite the fact that 
that there are more and more civil wars and conflicts than ever before. I think in terms of the realm of art, uh, and this, the, the insularity, as I men I've mentioned before, of the art world, that actually it's, there's, because of technology, there's much more accessibility to specific kinds of art and artists. So I think that's also another contributing factor to the fact that the world is seen as smaller, perhaps. Could, you wanted to add? Yeah. I just want to add two really brief things, and maybe, because um, I, I raced through a lot, but, um, what I would sort of polemically and provocatively call the Beirut school that sort of formed in the 1990s, I think has the strength and the influence that it does internationally because it was really, it was about a small group and community of people who came together in their city when nobody was sending visiting curators to go see them at all. So I mean, they were able to have this like very um, intimate, long and involved intellectual discourse yeah. amongst peers in a very, in a, at a quiet moment. And I think that that speaks to the idea of, of a community in a place that can be very serious with each other. Um, but the other thing is to think, maybe to flip it and think about what it's like to be an artist who grows up in Beirut, goes abroad to school and comes back and makes work and is forever called inauthentic by <laughs> the older generation of artists or peers who say, ah, but you, you, know, you learned all your ideas in the West, or you know, you're just bringing back this. I mean, even the term contemporary art in Beirut is, is still considered a Western import and an in in, in uh, international conspiracy and not really, it's like a style. It's, global, it's the style of globalization and it has nothing to do with the local culture. So I mean, it's a really, it becomes a very complicated situation, I think. I was told that once in Beirut, actually, that I work with contemporary artists, uh, not real artists. But uh, did you want to say anything? Yeah, uh, just shortly that I would say it depends on the, 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 the location you're at, the institution. You know, there might be good institution, uh, you know, art art schools and colleges in the Arab world, and there might be absolutely terrible ones in other places. And it would depend on which, you know, where you live. If you live in, a, in, in already a, 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 you know, intellectually vibrant place like Beirut, you know, it can sustain itself without necessarily exchange from outside for a... But, but in general, I believe in exchange. Okay, I think uh, critical exchange yeah. is a good thing. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Actually, I just wanted to pick up on the same uh, conversation with regards to encouraging that exchange within the region. It's amazing how few. I, I have a unique situation. I'm Pakistani, but I've lived in all over the Middle East: Egypt, Iran, Libya, Tunisia. I have lots of Palestinian friends. I, it's a very unique perspective that I carry. Um, but what is being done to make that less unique? What, you know, all of these exchanges I've had have happened in the West or by the uh, Western reality of extracting oil in the Middle East that my family was moved around for. So what is being done in, in, in the art world to make those inter-regional exchanges a reality? Because there are very good institutions in Lahore, for example, for art. Jesus. So how many people in Beirut know about that? If you, yeah, if you can uh, solve the visa situation for myself, I'd be glad um, to go everywhere. Or but even like to go from Pakistan to Bangladesh to get a visa, it's, it's, it's such a tricky thing or to, I mean, the visa thing. I the think visa is, thing you know, is a like, real issue. I mean, let's not I, yeah. kid ourselves. I mean, that is the unfortunate reality, political reality that we live in. And I have been working in the UAE for seven years. I apply, I'm the only one in my office in the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project that applied every month for a visa to go to the UAE for seven years. It's unheard of. And I was rejected several times and they reapplied and reapplied until I got it. And this is a condition. All my American colleagues are allowed entry and I'm not as a Jordanian passport holder. So the visa situation is a real unfortunate deterrent for dialogue and exchange. It's a material deterrent, and that's the situation. I mean, think about Palestine. And this is another polemic that is really, I mean, a lot of people can't just access, they can't go. Mm. And we're left in isolation. Uh, I wanted to add to that just because I only got my British passport five years ago and I couldn't go to somewhere like Beirut and I couldn't just go to somewhere to research the so-called artists of my generation or curators of my generation or to meet with them, although my 
you know, my colleagues, I, and I, had, I couldn't actually for years leave the UK where I had uh, a visa to only stay here and I never saw the European Union. And so until the very end, you know, so like it's kind of like <laughs> it's a joke about something, you know. Um, but more could yeah. be done. I mean, yeah. I agree that, you yeah. know, for example, people who are collecting works can also start artistic residencies, you know, as a kind of ancillary project. I mean, why can't these things be done? Uh, as a way to there are some right? so but it's not enough yeah. but what I, is, but I can tell you yeah, Stefan, yeah, yeah, for example yeah. homework space program yeah is open is an open call for students from all over the world and really targets the Arab world yeah Christine Thomas spends hours on the phone with the mukhabarat, with the intelligence, trying to solve visa issues for the students and not successfully mm -hmm. o overcoming yeah, them yeah, yeah. for most cases. And you're talking about Syria, Iran, you know, Palestine. I mean, she can't. I mean, this I, is a reality. I mean, but I do think that there are platforms that emerged, like uh, there's Dhaka Art Summit, for example, that bring together for a moment a group of people from different quadrants of a community. Whether it's a commercial art fair, you know, like Art Dubai, that maybe has connections to a sheikh or sheikh two, three, four, that maybe can work on the visa situation. So there are initiatives, but I do think as someone who, you know, started my life in Egypt and then moved abroad and then tried to reaccess uh, a context that the idea of movement you know does prevent cross disciplinary and a conversation in a really effect really real way and now with, with conflict you know places further it, it further I becomes agree. yeah ex exacerbated an issue but so to think about where we've c come today, so I tried to start off with a provocation and to really think of this idea of the body as a border and then to contextualize the Bargeel displays as an attempt to create some kind of historiographic look at a, at a century of Arab art, but also left it open to be criticized and to be polemicized. And then we moved very back in time where we talked about the founding of one Egyptian prince who wanted to found an art academy. But then there's st still this question of colonization and decolonization and sending students abroad. Then Hannah Feldman took us on a journey where she talked about telling time dif di differently, difficultly, badly, and really in that specific moment talked about the propositional nature of, that of museums and institutions that artists can create and why those institutions might never come to bear or to fruition. And then we moved into something which was very live where we had the Bargell Art Foundation's founder speak to someone else, someone he had idolized and who had led him to um, a kind of understanding of his collection. And I thought that was important to just establish a little bit of a basis as to how within this specific region philanthropy actually is one of the main ways that a lot of ideas circulate because state institutions, although they may hold thousands and thousands of objects of works of art, Egypt being one of those countries, to access them becomes a very difficult thing. And then we moved to Iftikhar, who's one of the catalog contributors, who really sought to kind of broaden as well this kind of this territorial boundary that we kind of spoken about. And then we, we ended the day with two different case studies. One looking at, yes, this Beirut school, particularly as a jumping off point of the 1990s, which I think has led in many ways to the understanding or became an entry point for contemporary Arab art for many a Western audience. And then we ended with Reem's case study of the Marrakesh Banya, which was a, a, a return to material culture and a re rejection of many of the things that we talked about today. So in a way, I hope that what we've left with is a set of questions um, that might propel us further in terms of thinking about our research. But to contextualize it, this day has only been a fragment into what Sofia Victorino and Antonia Blocker and my colleagues here at the White Chapel have been really trying to craft over the course of 16 months of conversations with Zina Sidero, of conversations with Herayr Sarkasian, and conversations with so many others in this room with artists, with curators, with Rasha Salti, who's here, who discussed the international exhibition for Palestine, while Wael Zaitar was sitting outside in Emily Jasser's exhibition. There, we've really tried to take and chop and dice this, some of these concepts, and I hope that it leaves you with some more room for thought, some more room for discussion and debate. Um, 
and I would like to extend a, a very warm thank you to all three of you uh, and to all of you for uh, right, being with us. Before we come to an end, I'd like to reiterate our huge thanks to Sultan Al Qasimi mm -hmm. and the Barjil Foundation yeah. because I think they really <laughs> contribute to a hugely important <laughs> debate here at the Whitechapel. <laughs> so a huge thanks to Sultan. I'm not sure he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. gone. I think, of course, another huge thanks is, is due to all the speakers, but I think mostly because of the, the thought-provoking nature of their presentations, but also their passion, which I think uh, brought a different life to the debate today. So thank you to all of you and to the previous speakers in the morning. Hi, Mandy.